Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for just another round of Ask Me Anything Creative Careers. So in these sessions, we are um, inviting an FCAT alumni who've graduated, um, say around the, uh, around the time of the last recession in Canada, say 2018, uh, 2008 and nine and 10, as we dipped deep below, and then we are trying to ride the wave out again, just to give you a little bit of, um, of the real talk on how it is when you graduate when things are not honky dory and that, um, you know, you can still make it, um, you can thrive and you can go on exciting careers. So today I would like to welcome uh, Ahmed Sagarbala and thank you so much for joining us, for My making pleasure. time and giving back in this special way to the FCAT community. And I'm uh, gonna kick off with a little introduction so that we know where I'm um, is coming from today. So, so I'm um, is a multifaceted member of the Ryerson community. He holds a master's degree in digital media and completed his undergraduate degree in graphic communications with a minor in marketing. He taught at six different schools within FCAT and TRSM and consulted on the Game of Thrones season six marketing campaign with Bell Media. In his previous role as a manager of industry relations for the MDM graduate program, he oversaw admi admissions, scholarships, and advisory board, equipment procurement, student research, and branding marketing initiatives. Currently, he's the digital experience manager at the Future Skills Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Thanks. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, I actually didn't know that I was being invited because of the parallel with the recession and the pandemic. So that's, that's a good so, point too. <laughs> not, not only, but it's kind of, yeah, it's, uh, it's not the only motivation, obviously, but it just feels so appropriate in this very moment, especially for class of 2020, as they are heading into these very uncertain times to just give them a few examples on, you know, how you handle these things, because they will just keep coming at us as we're going to move into ahead in our lives. Yeah. Oddly enough, uh, in the 90s, early 90s, late 80s, there was another recession that I was also involved with here in Canada. And at that point in time, my family decided to exit. We went back to uh, Dubai, which is where I was born. So uh, th this is before like all the buildings and all the developments started. Um, so when we exited and went back to Dubai, we were actually in a, a worse condition than if we just stayed in Canada. And it kind of speaks to sort of holding on to where you're investing yourself. So if you are invested in Canada, you have property and everything's going well, like you're able to sort of, uh, you know, uh, put on your straps and go through it. Uh, you can often recover much better after a reception, but if you exit and then try to come back, what's happening is uh, you're exiting at a low and you're coming back at a high. So it's, it's much more difficult to then start building yourself back up. Um, so we've had a few setbacks, uh, my family and, and I, um, and then uh, I remember being in the Middle East and the Gulf War was going on also. So we were in this very precarious position. Luckily, Dubai wasn't affected by that. Uh, but just moving back and forth, it forced me to sort of become very adaptive to the climate and not invest in one particular career path. And so when I was looking at graphic communications management, creative industries didn't exist back then, but uh, I probably would have ended up there otherwise. But uh, graphic communications management had this sort of hybrid program where you learn about print technologies, um, graphic communications and graphic design and such. And then also the business administration side of things, the management side. So I really liked how it had those three sort of pathways that I could take. Uh, and then at the same time, I did a bit of computer science at Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, and I dropped out of that and then kind of realigned with Ryerson after coming back from the Middle East. So I've been back and forth several times and doing, doing this sort of travel between countries also sort of set me up and kept me uh, adaptive, I would say. Yeah. Thank you so much for this little detour. It's actually super interesting. And thank you for giving the, you know, the global perspective on when you move, when you return, you know, what the level of resiliency and flexibility and adaptability that you gain is, it's an incredible experience, definitely. So how about if you now jump uh, straight into your short talk and after that, um, we will continue with questions and answers. 
Sure. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, I'll start with um, sort of my career path and some of the opportunities that I've had access to, uh, primarily because I was uh, active in the Ryerson Network when I was a student. Um, so I joined in 2004, Graphic Communications, uh, with a minor in marketing. The minor in marketing was sort of decided later. Uh, but during my first two years, I just tried to get involved as much as possible in what was going on on campus. Um, so it started sort of with orientation. And lesson learned, when I was at Laurier, I didn't participate at all. I didn't go to orientation. I just sort of uh, hung out at my apartment, which was off campus, which was another problem, I realized. Uh, so I was about um, 20, 15 to 20 minutes from campus walking. Uh, so I do my classes and I go straight back home. And so because I had sort of a lack of engagement with the student community and like professors and that sort of thing, I found that I wasn't enjoying my time at, at, at uh, Laurier at the time. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure when I came back to university, it took me about three years to get back to university. Um, I, I, I wanted to just immerse myself. And so orientation was great. I met a few people. They primarily weren't in my program, but there was one person that was in my program at one of the orientation events. And uh, he was very introverted. Uh, he, oddly enough, really liked karaoke. And th that was something I would never want to try. I, I kind of have tried it, but it's not something I want to keep doing. But he was really into it. And uh, uh, he was Korean. So uh, I guess uh, having, uh, what's it called? There's a dish that they throw all these vegetables and, and meats into and it cooks in this hot water. Um, yeah, so he, he introduced me to those sorts of things and it was kind of nice to be outside of my comfort zone. Um, and then also uh, getting involved with the student union. Uh, and that kind of fell into my lap because I was uh, freelancing as a graphic designer. So if you have um, any skill set that you can employ at this point, try doing it as a freelancer, try donating your time to charities. They often will take you on and let you do a few things for them. So uh, the one I volunteered with, for was called Accesso International. Uh, and they used to bring books to uh, South, South America. Um, and I noticed that their website was appalling and all of their materials weren't really branded. They had this weird globe logo with people on it, but you couldn't really tell what it was when you first looked at it. So. Uh, I went ahead and started like redesigning things for them just for nothing. And then after a year of like helping them out, uh, they gave me an honorarium, which I used towards uh, sort of my deposit to move to Toronto and, and get started at Rex. And um, yeah, so just getting involved with everything really set me up for like expanding my network. And I found that uh, once uh, classes had started, I kind of formed this group of three other people that were uh, really studious in the way they work. They were also very talented uh, in different ways from myself. Uh, so there's one uh, person, his name's Scott Millward. He actually teaches at Ryerson now. Uh, and he was uh, experienced operating printing presses and uh, getting things ready for uh, output. So you, if you're going to print multiple things on one sheet, you have to like impose it as it's called. So he knew all of that. And he was taking this graphic communications program in order to like broaden himself to be more of a business manager and also like learn the ropes of uh, uh, bookmaking and other things like that. Uh, then there, there was Diana who also teaches at Ryerson. Uh, so Diana Brown, who's now Diana Varma, uh, also teaching in graphic communications. Uh, she was a cheerleader at the time, uh, but had really, really good work ethic. And it was just something really admi admirable because she would go to all her sports events and then she would also get her work done and do a stellar job with everything she put her mind to. Uh, and finally, Nicola Kidd, who also teaches at Ryerson, um, was also part of my group. So it was like the four of us, uh, we were kind of just converging and we were all really driven to contribute to the community and, and create something. Um, uh, in a program where, you know, it's kind of like uh, business as usual. So it's like you're getting ready to join the print industry and here are the things that we usually do. And so what we're trying to do is sort of push the envelope and the four of us could rely upon one another. So it was really good to have that group. We were, we were really lucky that way. Uh, but at the same time, we also had classes where we were separated and then we'd create other groups and learn how other people work. So I found that really fascinating that we had that opportunity to do that. Um, so one of the things that happened when I was in my third year and graphic communications management is the chair approached me 
because I was creating quizzes for students to help, like, to help them study. So I used to create these web pages with drop downs, and you could kind of choose the answer. And I'd type up my notes and make fill in the blanks, basically. Um, so people could look at this, they could print it out, the blanks would appear. And on the website, you could click the drop down and see what the answer is. And so I was creating these study tools for, for my peers because it helped me study. Uh, so it was more selfish, oddly enough, like I was creating these things and I was sharing them, but it was really to help me study at the end of the day. And uh, yeah, the student body was using them and the chair found out about my study tools and she was like, there's two people in the program that are really close to failing and being removed. Uh, I'd like you to tutor them if possible. So I was like, sure, I'll try it out. So they gave us a room on campus uh, and we were able, like I had the key to it. We'd go in, unlock it, run these study sessions. Closer to exams, uh, the group went from two people to six people. And so we had all these people that were uh, really focused on getting by and uh, it was nice to help them out. Now, another thing that happened was a professor was hired uh, into, into the graphic communications program and he was, he found out that I knew how to program. So he's like, hey, can you tutor me because I want to learn how to program and I'll pay you. And I was like, that's very awkward to be teaching a professor. Uh, but we held these weekly sessions. He was taking a, a course at the Chang School. And, you know, I didn't expect to get paid for it, but he was like, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give, you, give you some money for every hour. So uh, two years after I graduated, I get a call from the chair of graphic communications, different person now because the chairs change every few years. And he said that my name had been put forward to teach. And usually to teach at the university level, you need a master's degree. And I didn't have one at the time. And so I was very honored uh, to be brought in at that time. And I, I, I jumped right in. So I was teaching a web design course. I did that for two or three years. And uh, I really enjoyed it. But because I didn't have a master's degree, uh, there's sort of seniority at the academic level. So I got bumped out uh, by the professor that I taught. Uh, he took my course and then returned for after sabbatical. So I, I lost that course and I really wanted to keep teaching. So what ended up happening is I did my master's degree. So I went to uh, the MDM program here at Ryerson, uh, completed a one-year professional master's degree. And I once again made sure I was contributing. I was helping out uh, management. So giving them feedback on how the program was doing, trying to augment the program by bringing in new ideas and uh, helping my peers. And I got tapped on, again, to teach and to manage the program. So I went from being a student in that program to managing that program. And then uh, uh, I, I had a two-year contract that ended and I moved on um, to the Future Skills Center because they were just opening up and they needed someone with my experience. So uh, I jumped in there as a digital experience manager. Uh, it's my first, well, second time being a manager at uh, Ryerson. Uh, very different atmosphere. Uh, I was employee number six. We're now over 30 people at the Future Skills Center and I've only been there a year. Um, so it's been like a nonstop ride. It's been a lot of fun, uh, but I find that uh, at the end of the day, if you're helping your peers and kind of doing it selflessly, uh, or if you have a way of doing something selfish but sharing with people, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I find that really benefits people. So uh, my mother always used to tell me, like, give and ex expect nothing in return. Uh, and oddly enough, it's like a really good formula for success. So if you go out of your way just to help people that might be struggling with a course, or uh, if they have a project, uh, let's just say they're trying to make some money on the side and they're not sure how to do something, if you help them out, like that will often turn into something else. And on that, um, that Game of Thrones um, advertising campaign that we did for season six, that was actually one of my peers in the master's program. Uh, he was tasked with uh, coming up with the, um, a, an advertising concept. Uh, he decided he would use a green screen booth and some lighting and bring in people that wanted to engage with Game of Thrones. So. Uh, they would have the dragon over their shoulder, uh, kind of put in through green screen. They wanted to act scared, like the dragon's going to attack them. It would be a three-second gif that would be created. And then they would share it with their friends through whatever social network they wanted to use. Uh, but the problem is, with, if you're trying to do this, the workflow is you set up a camera, you film it, you export the file, 
then you have to convert that video file into a GIF file and compress it down and then share it. So there's like three primary steps to this workflow. And it takes about 10 minutes on average. But if they want to do 3,000 people in a week, that's a lot of time, right? So I had to come in and sort of find a way of automating that process. So uh, I laced together a bunch of open source software. And the time it took to press the button on the keyboard is how long it took to output the file. So if you're doing a three second recording, you press the button, it starts the recording. It ends after three seconds automatically, and it puts the file in a folder. And then in that folder, uh, there's a watchdog script, as it's called. It'll pick up that file, compress it, and spit out a GIF file. So by the time they're done recording and the person gets out of the chair, that file is ready for sharing. Um, so we are able to do all 3,000 people um, across Canada in a week. Um, so it quite nice. They were trying to do something for Dr. Strange along the same sort of course. Uh, lesson learned, I gave them the workflow. I told them exactly how to do it. So now they could just do it on their own. So yeah, that was my stint with, uh, with uh, doing some marketing for Bell Media. Well, this is wonderful. You know, what's really fascinating, um, you know, every time you give back, it turns into an opportunity in, a, you know, uh, in a few years time or whatever it is. So as you mentioned, you gave away the workflow. So you may expect also very sometime soon this to turn out to something, you know, something else. Yeah. This is so fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing the recipe, you know, how to recreate opportunities you don't even know they might be there for you in the future but just you know being involved engaged uh, giving selflessly or selfishly it doesn't really matter but you know sharing with your community you you may as well just carve out an opportunity for yourself so this is great i know you've mentioned um in our uh, exchange that there are um these two things that uh, you would like to say something to which is the essential skills that will help you in any job and also how to prepare for the job that might not even be there yet or that's not even advertised you know so i was very curious about what you have to say for, to these yeah uh so it's top three essential skills in my opinion uh the first is excel uh, no matter what you do you'll always have to work with numbers you'll have to file your taxes you'll have to uh, come up with reports for people, especially if you're in management. If you're trying to move into that level, reporting is a, is a huge component of what you do. So learning how to use Excel and leverage it to make yourself look good is, is really good. So along those lines, if you are using Excel on a day-to-day -day basis, create templates. So uh, as a graphic designer, I always try to make my templates look good before they go out. So I'll just spend a little bit of time creating a single template and putting on like all the typographical flares on it, uh, titling and that sort of thing. And once I have that file created, uh, it's build once, output many. And that gets me to my second point, which is thinking like a programmer. Uh, of course, you have to learn how to program in order to get that mindset. But if you can think logically, sort of um, inputs and outputs. So if something happens, then this happens next. So there's a trigger and then there's an output. That sort of uh, thought process has really helped me because I can see, um, I can say set up a, a workflow for people. So if someone decides to do something on a Thursday, then it's probably gonna mean a certain people are gonna get affected and the output of a certain project will happen the following week. Um, it, this, this actually happened this week with me at the Future Skills Center. Uh, we're trying to get some forms created and typically the projects team will create uh, what they're looking for in those forms and then send it to me and I have to do a lot of interpretation on how that data should come in So what kind of form fields should we use to ensure that we're getting the data that's accurate and easy for the user? Um, so that's where the user experience comes in um, But that sort of thought process uh, If you can master it a lot of people don't and that's where I, I feel a lot of people that are thinking of user experience design and designing interfaces they have some trouble because the whole, the goal of it is to really think like the end user. So if someone's going to come to this form, how are they going to react to it? Are there certain pieces of information that we don't need to ask again and again um, in order to remove friction from the process, right? We want to make it really easy for them. Uh, but then again, there are points where you want them to stop and think, and that's where you want to inject some friction into the workflow. Uh, so that's, programming. It's like, how do I um, 
cause someone to go through almost like an obstacle course. And I want them to have like some easy wins and then some challenges that make them feel successful after they go through a process. Uh, and if they can uh, complete it all the time, it's kind of like um, they're those games where you can never die, right? So you keep playing it like Super Mario, the latest Super Mario, you can fall off a cliff a hundred times, uh, but you can continue from where you're at. And one of the beautiful things about Super Mario, to go off on a tangent, is uh, they have this uh, a guide. So if you're playing with Mario and you keep failing at a certain point in the level, it'll tell you, hey, do you want Luigi to come and help you as a guide? And then Luigi will go through the level and show you like how to time uh, sort of these contraptions that are moving. Like when do you jump so you can make it through there? When do you have to run really fast? So I find that brilliant. So if that could be set up in sort of what you're doing, that's really thinking like a programmer. Uh, you're making everything forgiving to the user, but you're also thinking you're putting yourself in their shoes in order to give them the best experience possible. So another way that programming really helps is efficiency. And I think if you're managing anyone and they're able to turn things around faster than you expect. So as an example, we've hired a few career boost students. We're going to be hiring another three career boost students come September. So keep your eyes open. Uh, uh, beginning of August, we're going to have some positions opening up. Uh, we also have about six or seven positions coming through also. So there's going to be a lot uh, opening up at the Future Skills Center. Uh, we're growing really fast. So uh, yeah, check the Career Boost website. But the Career Boost students that I've hired in the past, what I'll do is I'll kind of set up uh, an expected amount of time that they have to complete a task. And I'll add like 100% to it because they're trying to learn. And they're also like figuring out what the, what the expectations are by management, so myself. So I'll try to you know, do a write-up. I'll keep some ambiguity in there because they need to sort of uh, take ownership of what they're doing. And then I'll also tell them that they have to check in at certain points of time. So if I assign them something, they have to check in within 24 hours and let me know how things are going. And then the following week, they should be checking in again, depending on the scope of what they're doing. And so I'm programming that sort of process, right? I'm thinking about all the check-ins and scheduling it. So there's project management there. Um, but then I'll find out how long it took them to complete their task. And then I'll have to adjust for next time. Uh, so do I need to invest more time training them or can I do less? And we're just trying to come up with a sort of average for that uh, career boost student to complete their work. And so now once I have that programmed, I know that if I assign them something, the expected turnaround is within a certain period. Uh, so if they are doing things efficiently, they might turn things around in a few hours when I might give them a week. And at that point, they're a superstar, right? So if you can find ways of making your workflows or what you do more efficient, uh, you can make yourself look really good. And the other positive thing is you can make it really easy to do your work. So an example, back to uh, Scott Millward, who is also at Ryerson. Um, he told me about this time he had to uh, resize images for his school yearbook. Um, and so he had all these images that people had submitted, but the size of the images were all over the place. So Photoshop, like 10 years ago, had this, it still has it, has this option of automating. And you can take an image and size it down to a certain size and then output it into another directory. Sounds familiar, right? Like what I did with Game of Thrones. Uh, so you just have it go through the fo uh, folder and then spit out all the images. Now, while that was happening, because computers back in the day were much slower, you'd have to run it and just sit back and you'd see the image open, get resized, and then close. Image open. And if you have a thousand of these, you're just sitting at the computer, like, waiting. And so the, person, the manager comes in and was like, what, what are you doing? Like, why aren't you doing your work? You have a thousand images to resize. And he was like, oh, it's doing it. And the manager was like, whoa, you can do that? And then he looked like a superstar, of course. And then manager walked out and he could just like play cards on his desk, play solitaire or whatever while the computer did the work. So uh, I really enjoy that. I ended up using the same workflow for uh, a lamp company that I was making a catalog for. Uh, they had 1,500 images, same thing. I had to make a, a thumbnail and a big size uh, version for the website and um, keep a certain version for the catalog. So I'm spitting out three different images, grab the folder, run, run, run. So that is like any time you want to look like a superstar, if you can set up like a little workflow. And just like 
Google it, right? Like one of the best things you can do is not ask your manager right away. It's like hit the search engine, hit up Reddit. I find Reddit phenomenal for this sort of thing. Um, so if you want to look at like our Photoshop, which is one of those channels and ask a question, uh, they'll upvote your question because it will be a good question because you're actually applying it. And then they're going to give you solutions that you never thought existed. Uh, and so anytime I'm challenged with like something I've never heard of before, like how on earth am I going to take data from Google Analytics and put it into a, a report and output a PDF? I'm like, how am I going to do that? And so I'll just look online and there's like, oh, someone's created the script. Let me run it. Oh, it works. Oh, I have my output. Great. Now I can just like create my report in five minutes. So I, I literally have this website that I go to now. Uh, I'll, I'll say, okay, for the Future School Center this quarter, show me how uh, the website traffic was you know, for that quarter. And it always wraps it in our branding and it puts images for like provinces and territories people came from, how many visits, what pages were the most successful, where were people going, where did people leave the website? So I have this report that just gets spit out every quarter. Something that used to take me like two or three hours to do is now a click. Uh, so do it, like learn to program, even on a very basic level. Uh, there's a website called Code Academy. Go through their tutorials, it's free. And if you can like master HTML, CSS, so you know how the, web's, the web works. And then maybe like something a bit more deep in the trenches like Python or PHP or C++, just choose anything. Uh, you don't have to finish it, but just learn like the basics of if statements and for loops and while loops, right? So th there's a few concepts you can go through. If you do any of their lessons, it's got a very logical path for you to follow and, and, and sort of learn those things. And then, it's about analogies. So this is sort of like getting you ready for the, the jobs of the future. If you can take something, uh, a concept today and come up with an analogy that will adapt it for the future, then you're set. So uh, an example, I have a few examples in fact, because I collect these. Um, the first would be uh, telephone lines, right? So you pick up the phone, you dial a number, you hold it to your head, and then on the other line, it's going to ring. If the person picks up, you'll hear their voice and then they can start talking. Now that whole uh, conversion, because you're calling a person, they have a name. Uh, but in order to call them, you have to find out what their ID is or their phone number, right? So the same thing happens when you're trying to use a website. You're going to type in the name of the website, like google.com or ryerson.ca, and it will automatically convert that name into a string of numbers. And that's known as an IP address, right? So if you can understand the concept of phoning someone, you already understand how computers get to websites. And so now it's not a hard concept. Um, understanding how the web works or even how the web looks is also a very simple concept, but you need an analogy like a spider's web, uh, the information superhighway, right? How cars connect through roads. That's an analogy that helps us understand like, if all these servers are connected, so think of each server as a city center, right, with lots of applications within it, so blocks, uh, you're gonna drive from one city to another. That's how, um, that's how computers communicate. So uh, there's many, many more of these, and I, I just love like finding them online because it's all about compression. It's about taking a very hard concept and simplifying it to a very easy, communicatable concept. Uh, and compression is one of those things, right? How do I take a string and convert it into a zip file? Uh, it's about encoding. It's about converting it. So if I can take my name, which is Ahmed Sagarwala, and my sister started calling me Am when I was 13, like that's a compression of a huge name. Ahmed Reza Sagarwala is now just two letters. And the great thing is it also programs me. So Am, like to be a morning person, or I am, so now I'm a philosopher, right? So um, I really like compressions for that reason. And these sort of analogies help you adapt to what's coming up ahead. So if you can just like uh, reframe your perspective on the, on the world and not look at things literally, but think of them figuratively, then you can really like make the jump as you're going through professions. Um, another way of thinking of this, just a final one before we get to some more questions, uh, would be to think of how like a company operates. Right? So you have a hierarchy, right? So it's kind of like this pyramid. You have this person right at the top and you're kind of at the bottom when you first start off typically, unless you guys are superstars, but let's just say there's that hierarchy and you're like at the bottom and it's like, oh, I want to be up there. And, and so you can think of it as like going up a ladder 
but you could just like walk into the person's office and start talking to them, right? But you don't have to go up a ladder. You just have to reframe how the hierarchy is described. So if you start thinking of an organization as a web, now what you've done is you've democratized your, the entire company. And you, you've kind of said like, the person in the CEO's office is a human being. I'll just go talk to them like a human being and they'll appreciate it. Uh, they might be bored out of their minds because no one comes and talks to them, right? Uh, they might have, uh, you know, a, a lull in their day. And if they're just walking through the office, have a conversation. Uh, I remember Sheldon Levy, uh, previous uh, president of Ryerson, he used to do this thing where he'd walk through campus on a daily basis, just quietly, hands behind his back, walking through the campus, observing. And once in a while, students would notice him and then talk to him. Right. So they're like, hey, Sheldon. And then he'd be like, yes. Yeah, so how, how are you enjoying Ryerson? And they'd be like, oh, you know, it's uh, it's great. But uh, there's a lot of traffic on this road. Right. So he's like, oh, what would you do? Um, close the road. OK, let, let, let's do it. Like, let's hold a town hall and see what's involved in closing down a street. And Gould got closed down. You know, um, there used to be very few uh, plants. On uh, sorry, I'm hearing a squeaking sound. Are you guys hearing that? It is, okay. I don't know if it's on my headset or in the room or what. Anyways, um, yeah, so Sheldon Levy used to walk through campus and another thing that happened was he noticed how concrete it was. And then they started adding planters and, and like beautifying the street. And it went a long way to like making the campus more you know, approachable to, to the students and made it more enjoyable. Like all these farmers markets and that sort of thing that open up in the summer, unfortunately, that's not happening this year, but I'm sure. You know what? I had like no idea that that street was ever like a go through street. So this is so interesting. Also getting a little bit of a perspective on the campus really, because all we know is how green it is, how walkable it is, but like these things, you know, like many of us on the call here, like have no idea about. We yeah. got gotten a few comments here from students like, way to think out of the box they really loved your examples they love the analogies that you shared i love the behind the scenes tips myself you know how you think as a manager as a hiring manager what is it you know that you want out of the applicants or people who work on your team and i also love the little spoiler alert that you have a bunch of more jobs coming out in august so yeah. i would encourage everyone to keep an eye out and we will definitely do a big push in terms of emails and social marketing campaign on our careers end as well. Yeah. I would open up the floor to, I know we are a little bit over time, but um, if anyone has a burning question, one or two, I'm opening the floor now to see if we can get these answered. So anyone, do you have any tips when creating a website from Simran? Oh yeah, definitely. It's where I spend a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to start with once again, the human sort of approach. So forget about like the digital aspect of the website, really think about it like from a design perspective. So I, I'm talking web design here, not development at all. Just like, how do we make the website really communicatable? Uh, and there's, there's sort of two things that I like to do. The first is wireframe and, and create mockups, just draw it on paper. Uh, I use this app called Prototyping on Paper. It's by a company called Marvel. Uh, with two L's, M-A-R-V-E-L-L. -L. So uh, you can quickly take pictures of your mockups and bring them into the app and just add hit spots. So if you have really good sketching capabilities, then you can get something really polished quickly. But the app also has a drag and drop option. So you can sort of throw things together and then add hit spots. So when you hit one of these buttons, it'll go to the next page. And you can make it look like a real application or website. So that's that's one thing I like to do. Just start with uh, drawing and forget the the technical side of like the tools. Uh, the next thing I like to do is think about um, uh, personas for the website. So the website as a human being. So uh, let's just say um, I'm going to Amazon. So if I were to make a human being out of Amazon, uh, it's like this person that's standing at the front of a massive warehouse. Like there's a big door behind them and they're kind of sitting there with the table and it's like, hey, what do you want? And you tell them what you want and then they suddenly slide open a window and it's like, here you go. Like we have a hundred different types of batteries and it's kind of information overload, but that's how they work, right? Here's 10,000 batteries, choose one. Oh, you want the five-star ones? Here they are. And it's just like, 
you know, it's showing a whole bunch of stuff. So that's Amazon as a persona. So if you're going to create like, um, let's just say it's a website that helps uh, people. Um, it's a support website for people that um, have experienced domestic violence. Okay. So what should that person look like? It shouldn't be someone standing in front of a warehouse with sliding doors, right? That would, that would kill things. Uh, what, sorry about the analogy there. What, what you want is sort of someone that is caring that will walk with you, right? So it's like, hey, um, are you here to just learn about our services? Or do you actually have a challenge? If they have a challenge, it's like, okay, let me walk with you and, and try to give you the support you need. If they just want to find out about the organization, then you can do this sort of slide deck presentation sort of thing. So think about the website as a human being and how they would convey the information or how they would steward the user uh, through their workflow. So those are, those are two tips I have when creating websites. I really love your analogies. It just makes everything so lively and vivid and you can go off on your, in your brain like, wow, yeah, exactly. I know what he's talking about. <laughs> Um, we have yeah. a second and the final questions before we gonna wrap things up. Um, and um, you're, I know you're on LinkedIn, so if students have more questions, uh, I'm sure yeah. they can reach out and connect with you. So the final question is, what can a virtual onboarding of junior employees look like um, at you know, Future Skills Center or Ryerson during COVID times? Yeah, hey Elda, we've met. <laughs> uh, okay, so onboarding, honestly, it's been quite tricky. And there's a bit of a, a difference between the way I might onboard and someone else. So depending on your team, things will, things will change. Uh, with my team, I primarily use things like Asana uh, to organize uh, work and have people check in without checking in. So this is one of those automated things. So if you complete a task, you don't, you do that. But the onboarding is really just a series of like, okay, here's a bunch of uh, tutorial videos that have been created. Uh, here's the team. There's weekly meetings, status meetings to get you up to speed. Uh, the Future Skills Center is uh, one of those complicated organizations because we're a consortium. So uh, figuring that out was difficult for me and I'm sure other people have had their difficulties there. Uh, but it's like, we expect to be the ones uh, creating the skills programs, but we're not. Uh, we're there to support the organizations that are creating the skills and uh, support programs for Canada. So uh, that is one of the, the tricky parts. And then meeting the team and having our, our conversations. A lot of the onboarding is on Zoom, unfortunately. Uh, when things go back to some form of normal, like when people are actually uh, meeting in person or in the office in person, uh, onboarding is a lot of like, let's, let's collaborate on one thing. And, you know, as someone junior, you might come to someone more senior and ask them like how they would do something. And then they would share, uh, everything. A lot of it is, um, self-directed, you could say. So if you are onboarded, like we'll give you access to a lot of stuff. Like there's an entire team drive with thousands of documents, maybe even tens of thousands of documents now. Uh, and it's, it's hard to find where things are. That's why I like Asana because I put links in there. But other people might tell you like, here's the folder that you have to find and then you kind of have to, to do it yourself. Each, I think having that understanding of how an organization's uh, collaboration tools are in place. So Google Apps, so if you're at Ryerson, you know this already, it's pretty easy. Uh, if you go to a Microsoft shop, like you'll have to really quickly learn how to use those applications. Uh, and as a Ryerson student, you have access to Linda, which is now LinkedIn Learning. And honestly, if you ever have a challenge with a digital tool, like go there, subscribe to one of their lessons. You can usually finish them in a few days. I still do them. Uh, I had to learn something for Google Analytics. I'm still on there. So it's amazing to have that uh, access. It's hard when you're in school and courses are keeping you overloaded to do them. but if you are planning on learning something, just add it to um, your catalog. You can create a list of courses that you want to take in the future, and then you just play it through once in a while. So I find that really helps you look really sharp when you're starting up. Uh, for anyone applying to a job anywhere, two things that I'd love to see you do. The first is find out who you're mailing. Like, don't just say hiring person. Find out who you're going to speak to. Uh, and you don't have to just throw your uh, resume or application into the abyss and expect to return. Um, set up, a, I used to set up coffee meetings when I was thinking about applying for a job. Like, hey, I'm thinking about applying at this um, company. Uh, I just want to hear some ideas and like want to know about how it's been for you. And usually people will take you up on that. It's a free coffee for them. And you meet them at location, right? 
Uh, so I used to do that. Now it's like a Zoom meeting. Just set up a Zoom meeting and um, try to not make it like you just want to get information from them. Try to find out if there's a way that you can also help them, right? So, uh, hey, I, I hear you're doing a lot of graphic design in your role. I'd like to hear more about it. And if there's any way that uh, I can quickly mock up something for you, I'd like to help, right? So now you're kind of like investing some time into them. And it's sort of an exchange. It's not a one-way road. Um, the second thing that I'd love all of you to do if you're applying to a position, uh, aside from addressing the per person and finding out who they are, is send out your resume, wait one week. If you don't hear back, if they don't acknowledge that they've received it, just get to that human and say, hey, I sent in the resume. If there's anything else you need, let me know. I'd really like to work here, right? Something like that. And the last person I hired did that. They did just that. So we're hiring a career boost student. They put everything in one nice package and sent it in. So I didn't have to ask them for additional information. And their portfolio was easily accessible and they followed up. That was it. Like I had three people that I was thinking between and that just sealed the deal. So consider doing that too. Wow, thank you so much. This is like, well, if I if I was in that position now looking out in the job market, what there is for me, I would definitely jump on your suggestions. So practical, so insightful. Thank you so much for this conversation for today with us, yeah. making the time for sharing your journey and so many hands-on tips that we can actually now take and implement in our professional development, on our professional development journeys. So really appreciate that. Thank you everyone for joining us today here. If you have any additional questions, um, feel free to reach out to um, on LinkedIn. And um, yeah, everybody enjoy the afternoon and hopefully at some point see you on campus. Yeah. Bye. Have a good one. Bye.